I hope everybody can hear me. Um, if not, if our testing hasn't been adequate, then somebody should be coming in the office to interrupt me in any minute and tell me that we don't have a good broadcast. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, my name is Clive Brown. I'm the CTO of Oxford Nanopore. I'm presenting today on behalf of Oxford Nanopore. Um, and uh, I believe we're quite a number of people uh, online at the moment watching. <clears throat> now, the purpose of this um, presentation is to give uh, what you might call a mezzanine update uh, from us, uh, by which sort of in-between update. There are a number of things that we've been working on over the past uh, months. That are, some of them are on track and some are a little bit behind. And we have our major conference coming up later in the year. Uh, so timing-wise, we wanted to give uh, a very important intermediate uh, update and I'll be making a couple of sort of uh, quite significant announcements during this talk. Um, so we're going to talk about some chemistry improvements that we're rolling out uh, imminently. We're going to talk about some important software releases and I'm going to give I think very importantly uh, a status update on Promethean. Uh, obviously you know that people have been uh, waiting for and ordering that device for uh, about six months now. So I think it's time for quite a detailed update for those people. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, our existing customers have had a lot of prior visibility of this via our support portal. If you're an Anapol customer, you get an account on our portal, and you can go on there and talk to people and see the latest stuff and uh, look at updates and talk to me. So most of what I'm talking about today has been uh, uh, discussed in, uh, in prospect on the portal. We also have a thing called a developer license. Um, I think there's about 20 people on it at the moment. And there's a special subgroup of people who have that license. Uh, and, and those people have had more visibility of what I'm about to talk about. We've been discussing what I'm presenting today for about six months or so. Uh, so uh, here it is. So first of all, let's just recap what nanopore sequencing is. Again, I, I'm pitching this talk at existing customers, people on the Promethean waiting list, and people thinking about becoming customers. Nanopore sequencing is an old idea, uh, going back at, at least 20 years. I'm not quite sure what the exact date is. Um, and there's been an awful lot of background academic work on it over the past 20 years or so. Obviously, Nanopore has done a huge amount of work uh, making a, a commercially viable product over the past eight years or so. And since we uh, launched Benign about a year ago, perhaps a little bit longer, uh, there have been 40, 40 papers. And the version of Nanopore sequencing that we've embodied in our product for now 
is called strand sequencing. And what that means is um, an intact single strand of DNA is passed through a, a nanopore that's in some sort of insulating membrane, and then we can sense current uh, generated by an applied potential across that pore um, as the DNA moves through the pore. And this is uh, an old notebook sketch from Professor Diemer uh, that shows the outline of the idea. He's one of the original founding inventors of uh, strand sequencing on quite an old pant. And you see the basic idea is that we see deflections in current as um, bases transit the pore. And that's because the DNA provides a differential block on the current flow of, of ions induced by the applied potential. And so we've got a time series at the bottom here, and uh, those deflections should reflect the composition of the DNA. Now, this is, in reality, it's a little bit more complicated, but in essence, it's correct. Uh, so in, in more detail, this is what we're looking at. So a nanopore sequencer is a parallel array of this basic componentry. Uh, there, is a there is a membrane, which is an insulating membrane, and on each side of the membrane, there's an aqueous solution of, uh, of salt of some sort. And then we have the pore itself. Uh, now, there are lots of pores that work, and we give them version numbers. Uh, and just so you're familiar with the jargon, we talk about R7, R8, R9, R10. The R refers to a pore version. And DNA naturally will transit the pore at a million bases per second. So we use a, a heavily engineered enzyme system that we've developed that's pre-bound onto the DNA. And so that forms a uh, transient complex with the top of the pore and breaks the DNA. It's a ratcheting break. It breaks the DNA, allowing us to measure at a much more sensible speed, like 200 bases per second. And the version numbers we use on the job and version numbers we use on the enzyme is E, E for enzyme. And I think E7 is the latest version. And we have different membranes. Different membranes have different noise characteristics, uh, M9, M10, for example. It's another component that we can upgrade and on which we've done a lot of work. So um, <clears throat> there are several components inside a strand nanopore sequencing system, but they're all uh, subject to continuous upgrades. That's something we've been doing for a couple of years. Indeed, the first, uh, the first pool we went out with, not shown here, was R6. And I think uh, within two or three months of that, we transitioned onto R7. So when we array those out, we have uh, an array means a two-dimensional you know, collection of them. Uh, we have a bunch of single pores in membranes on a sensing system, um, and they work in parallel. And importantly, they're not synchronized. They just operate at their own speed. They grab DNA from solution, and each pore generates its own signal. And underneath each pore, we have sensing circuits, very, uh, very good, um, with very good signal-to-noise on them, and very quick sensors. Um, and those sensing circuits are inside this little gray square here, which is called an ASIC, which is another key component uh, that we developed or co-developed at Nanopore. Many people thought this was impossible, but there it is. ASIC is Application Specific Integrated Circuit. So on the existing MINAN that goes out, there are 512 circuits, but they're looking at over 2,000 nanopores. And that's because we have a, a switch in between the pores and the circuits that lets us pick the best channel at runtime. Uh, so a single nanopore per well, uh, you can have hundreds or even hundreds, of, I'll talk later, thousands of channels. A channel is a pore and a circuit, it's called a channel. Um, and you can sense many, many analytes per pore per channel. Importantly, again, a key differentiator of this system is that we sample molecules from solution on a real-time basis. The typically, the sample is not attached to the system or flow cell. It's a sampling device from solution, which is important. And then here's the, uh, the product that's available at the moment. This is the MinIron. Um, and uh, just to talk, I think people are pretty familiar with it now from Twitter, I would imagine. But it's a USB-powered, portable, low-cost DNA sequencer. Uh, this is a, a metal case and a heat sink. There are some connectors here. There's a sort of a single board computer inside here that controls uh, the sequencing. And there's some uh, uh, insulation, various types, to screen out any electrical noise. And the action really occurs in what we call the flow cell. This thing at the top, this is the black thing with the snake-like input channel, output channel. This is the flow cell. And the yellowy square is where the pores are. And the pores are sitting in a membrane in there. And the electronics is underneath that yellow square. 
And so a user puts a DNA sample in here in, in liquid. Uh, they connect this to the device and then software runs, pulls DNA through the pores and we generate signals and decode them. That in essence is what the MinIron does. So again, just to recap, um, again, uh, most people watching this will be familiar with this stuff, but I, I just want to cover the ground for new people. There are two basic ways that we read uh, the DNA. One is what we call 1D. And all that means is um, we uh, measure the uh, first template strand, as it were, the forward strand of the DNA as it goes through the pore. That's it. It's called 1D. Uh, single pass. Uh, the second type is what we call 2D. And in the case of 2D, uh, in the sample prep, we've attached a hairpin to one end of the DNA. And so what happens is we read the first strand, in other words, there's a 1D step. The enzyme goes around the hairpin and then reads the second strand. And then we can combine both strands together when we come to decode the data. So there's the 1D version and the 2D version. Now, we're uh, very keen on 1D, and importantly, um, it's where we want to go, really, the 1D side, not least because we immediately double the throughput of the system by using 1D. But it, the sample preps that we can apply to that are very simple, very quick, and themselves can be embedded in little portable devices of various types that we're working on. So for example, um, I think it's not well understood out there, uh, even though I talk about it every so often, that the read length you get out of this system is really proportional to the fragment distribution that you generate in the sample prep. I think, I think every other sequencer, the read length is limited by the sequencing chemistry itself. In this case, it's a step before that. It's what you do to the sample that generally gives you the read length distribution. So a typical 2D would look like this, this histogram, the first one, with a mean of around 10 kb. And you can move that mean around depending on how you do your sample prep. Some people have done longer. Some people have done shorter ones. But with a 1D, we get a distribution more like uh, the, the, on the right-hand side here. And this is a, a, a transposase. And uh, what that gives us is uh, this sort of long tail of very long fragments. And a not bad median and a not bad mean, typically in the tens of kilobase uh, regions, uh, using a transposase called MUA. Now, uh, what some people do, some, there are some platforms out there where they also generate these kind of fragment distributions, and they then enrich the long fragments using other upstream. And you can do that with Nanopore as well. Of course, the price you pay for that is you'll require more input DNA if you want to enrich up to these longer fragments. And there are probably versions of the MUA prep that I'm thinking about that would skew this distribution to the right anyway. But I think the key killer thing for it is it's, ten, it's a 10 minute sample prep. So if you can lyse cells or get DNA and you can apply MUA and you can get the resulting uh, liquid into the flow cell, then on top of uh, the, uh, the real time generation of full length reads, you can you know, very quickly get from sample to answer in sort of theoretically 15 minutes. Somebody reported recently that from the time they introduced uh, some viral DNA into the MinIron, they were able to identify the viruses within four minutes. So here's a 10 minute prep with, for example, a few minutes of identification of it. Uh, we have the upstream problem there of, of getting things out of cells. But we're, we're working on that. I don't think that's an intractable problem. Now let's talk about throughput, probably one of the other most misunderstood uh, results of multiplying numbers together is how much data you can get per unit time, which is what throughput is. <clears throat> now we designed our sequences to be fast, and probably the first thing I spoke about in 2012 was the ASIC and the speed of measurement of the ASIC. It measures orders of magnitude quicker than the typical kind of CCD array you'll find in an optical camera-based system. Even though the number of channels is smaller, the speed at which you can measure is disproportionately quicker. So for example, um, when we came out with the early access MinIron, we were running DNA through at between 10 and 100 uh, basis per second. I think what people are running at the moment is, um, is uh, about 70. Uh, what I'm going to talk about in a minute is, is our initial first draft release of fast mode, which is where this pink dot is. Well, we're looking at running at about 300 basis per second. But we know from other chemistries we've been playing with that we can do 500 basis per second. 
And indeed, we've even got one that we've had up to 1,300 bases per second. And the ASIC, the electronics, can deal with measuring at that kind of speed at reasonable accuracy. So the example I showed at London Calling last year was this very slide. So on 512 channels at 500 bases per second, the maximum you will get is 20 gigabases per day. And as we run for two days, the maximum possible would be 40 gigabases from one flow cell. Uh, and at, at, uh, at 300, actually I'm not sure what the number is there, I'll put it later on, but you can still get a considerable amount of data at 300, well, you'll get 70% you'll get of 20 gigabases per day. Now, Promethean, which is coming along, has a different kind of flow cell, and that flow cell has a different ASIC, a newer ASIC, and that ASIC has 3,000 channels in it. So from Promethean at 500, we'd be expecting from one Promethean flow cell, 120 gigabases maximum per day. And in total at the top here, if we have all the Promethean uh, flow cells running flat out at 100% efficiency, which never happens, but the theoretical maximum would be uh, 6.4 uh, terabases per day. Uh, now we're going to talk about what, uh, what's holding that, th that theoretical throughput back and how we're going to fix it a little bit later. But that's where a NARPOR sensing device can get to. And I made the point again at London Calling that in, prin in principle, Manipore devices are very high throughput devices. Uh, I don't think people realized that when they were conceiving the idea of Manipore sequencing. So speed of sensing for us has been key. So we have fewer things, but we're measuring them much more quickly. And the, the multiplication of numbers means that we do very well indeed. So we're going to come out with fast mode, uh, broadly available to everybody. Um, uh, and there are some kit updates that are required for you to be able to do that on the system. Uh, the first one is this thing on the left, uh, which is uh, an R9 version of our uh, sample prep. In other words, it's compatible with the R9 core, forwardly compatible. And this does uh, both 1D and 2D reads. There's a new enzyme in there. I think it's, I think it's E7, I can't remember. And you can do 250, they've hedged it here. You can actually do 250 to 300 bases per second on this kit. Uh, on the right-hand side, broadly available, also completely compatible with R9, forwardly, is the Transposome 1D kit. And that's the 10-minute kit. Uh, two tubes, 10 minutes, and we're done. And again, that runs at 250 to 300 bases per second. So both of those kits are coming out imminently. I have a timeline at the end that should make that clear for you. So first of all, we're going to upgrade the kits. I spent some time at London Calling trying to uh, explain something that's really quite complicated. And if you're not an aficionado of nanopore sequencing or a maths person, this might be tricky to understand. But the essence of it was that uh, the pore and the controlling enzyme, as well as having uh, behavior in the block dimension, that is, the uh, deflection in current caused by the DNA, they also have interesting behavior in the time domain. And historically, we haven't really exploited that. Um, but uh, as I outlined again over a year ago, we've been looking at chemistry versions now that have what we call a non-exponential uh, behavior in the time domain. Um, and what that means is you miss less. It means that you uh, can measure more and more quickly and miss less. Um, uh, Things which are to the left of this dotted line, uh, you might miss. Uh, but things to the, to the right, you would not miss. So the time domain behavior of some of the newer chemistries is very uh, very good for us because you just get more measurements of more things. Now, as again, as aficionados will know, where the poor measures camers anyway, it measures short words anyway. So missing things isn't such a big problem uh, anyway. But this just makes it much better. And having this non-exponential behavior means that we can run things even quicker, we can run things really quickly, uh, such that we, we don't really miss anything in informatics. So it's all about speed. So we end up with the, uh, the measurements of KMAS being more bunched around uh, a commonly observed mean than you would from, say, an exponential system, as I have on the far left here. And there are poor, poor enzyme combinations which are, are exponential, and there would be a, a more limiting speed problem on those systems. So we're moving towards these non-exponential uh, time domain behaviors on our enzyme core combinations. 
That's all great. So uh, what kind of throughput do people really get? Well, it's limiting at the minute. This, this final line on this graph shows uh, how, how many Gs you should be getting as the maximum over time. And there are some things eating into that. And you can see that during a run, and most people know this, people who run this know that the first six hours are the best. And then you, your cumulative uh, output tends to tail off for various reasons as the run proceeds. And the big, the big thing that uh, is eating into that is what we call blocking. And it's a blocking behavior that frankly seems to have appeared over the past 18 months, seems to be intrinsic to the current system that we're looking at. And some investigations have been done on this. And people have also shown externally that, for example, PCR samples uh, give more data at higher quality. People have shown that storing things in fridges tends to degrade the throughput and the quality. It looks like damage to the DNA um, induces nicks in the DNA that then somehow cause this uh, degradation of throughput over time, as shown on the right-hand side here. Uh, so uh, we can now measure the problem, and we have a smoking gun candidate for what's causing it. And so a lot of work is now being done on removing this sort of 50% loss after 24 hours. Uh, and I'm hoping that, I don't have anything to show today other than what we think the problem is, but there are various solutions for it. I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk about that quite definitively at London Calling later this year. And then hopefully people start to get the much, much higher throughputs, the multiple gigabases uh, per day that are possible. So, so obviously, the, apart from what I'm going to talk about today, the next big issue is to just resolve this, uh, this little loss problem. I hope that's clear. Now then, <clears throat> here's the biggie. So we've been working to improve, uh, improve the uh, so-called accuracy, which is, you know, frankly, a quagmire to talk about. Not that many people really understand it, but I'll try and talk about it in terms that most people can relate to. So um, <clears throat> looking at the, uh, the pore that we've been working on, which is called R9, um, running at 250 bases per second, that's the bottom graph, using a hidden Markov model base caller. Now, we've, this hidden Markov model base caller has been the workhorse of base calling here for over three years, and it's the one that we run in the cloud. Uh, people who run um, through metric call will be familiar with what comes back. It comes through this HMM. Um, now, moving to R9 at 250 bases per second, all things being equal, we've been getting uh, 1D and 2D accuracies as shown at the bottom here. So on the HMM, the old caller, at two, it's actually a little bit higher than that, 260, 270. We're getting uh, the 1Ds of around, you know, in the, between 75 and 80, and the 2Ds of a mean of around 90 or a bit less than 90. However, we have been, thankfully, looking at some alternative, having done an exhaustive study of the uh, what's causing error, We've been looking at some different kinds of base calls. So just to go back to that slide, so there's some improvements here just from moving to R9. There's some chemistry improvements. But also we've improved the data quality quite considerably by using a different base call framework. Um, and in particular, we've been looking at using uh, these recurrent neural networks um, that are quite popular with these uh, deep learning advocates, in particular, a thing called LSTM. And all that means is it's a neural network that can learn the signal, but it can learn much more context. So because it's a biological system, we know there are little, little edge effects uh, on the signal that don't quite get captured by the HMM. So it looks like these neural network systems are capturing those edge effects a little bit better. This is still fairly preliminary, but on the latest R9 system at 250 basis per second, we're getting a 1D mean now of around 85 and a 2D mean of around 95% accuracy. Now, really, this, uh, again, people who are customers who've been on the portal will know that I've been talking about this for a while. We're pretty confident now that we can release this as our first release. Uh, and this is the sort of baseline performance that we want to go out with fast mode. Um, and uh, so the sort of marketing hook here is the 1D is roughly equivalent to where arguably PacBio got traction. They may have improved since then, I'm no doubt. And the 2D is now getting into the zone of, of capillary sequencing. Um, and the rate of improvement on this system, on the poor and the software, is such that I think everybody's very confident that within a few weeks or months, 
both of these distributions will have moved quite considerably to the right. And the target is to get the, the 2D into sort of 1% Q20 and have the 1D at, at say 10%. And I think the general feeling is that we can do that. Now, our, what is, what is um, what's this R9 thing he's talking about? Well, again, people who are customers will know that we've been talking about it for quite a while. Um, I'm going to talk about what it is in a second, but here are some uh, here are some well-known and published nanopores in section at the top and top-down view at the bottom, just to show people what we're dealing with with protein nanopores. And you can see, uh, again, I think the crystal structures for these are all available, and there are fairly extensive publications for all of them. Um, and there are other pores not shown here. There are pores for which there aren't crystal structures. There are pores where people have got them not yet published, and there are things in patents and all sorts. But here, here are the sort of uh, the usual suspects in other pores, I suppose. And you can see immediately that they're very different shapes. Uh, and the relationship between shape and behavior is a complicated one. And I think many years of uh, PhD students trying to get to terms with that. Uh, we do it empirically, mostly. So you see this pore on the right hand side here, it has this, basically it's a tube, although there are some narrow points in it. But it's a tube and you can get decodable signal out of that one. This is the hemolysin pore, uh, which is very well understood. And uh, it has this sort of open area, sort of tulip shape with a tube. People have mutated this quite extensively. Uh, you can truncate the barrel. You can interchange subunits, the same as this one. You can truncate the barrel, you can interchange subunits. This is the MSPA pore from Mycobacterium smegmatis here, which has this um, this sort of funnel shape with a little hole at the bottom. Uh, there's a top-down view. And this is CSGG, which is uh, a pore that's been published for about uh, 13 months, I think, with a top-down view. And this one is a sort of tube with a sort of, I suppose, what you call a flange in the middle of it. You can see it there. Now, um, I first spoke about R9, which is a, a, a pore, at our London calling conference in May of last year. Uh, and I said, and the fact there's my slide, there's me. There he's looking very, uh, got to do something about that belly, frankly. But there's the slide. So the point about R9 is it's got a very different signal profile from R7. Um, it's got a sharper read ahead, it's more discriminating. Uh, we actually now think that most of the signal comes from two bases. Uh, you know, it's, it's a short word poor in principle. And it seems to have fewer long range interactions compared to the R7 series. Uh, but even so, that neural network is still learning those interactions better than the HMM is. And it's improving. That was, that was, our, that was our 9 I spoke about. So we're releasing R9 as part of our fast mode update. And here is R9. Uh, it's the holy grail, it's hence the long-running and not very funny joke involving Monty Python. Um, R9 is in fact the CSGG pore from E. coli. In fact, this pore is found commonly in uh, most gram-negative species, absent in the gram-positives, so you don't find it in mycobacterium, for example. It's actually a lipoprotein. You can argue if that's different, but I think it's different. It's not a pure protein, it's a lipoprotein. Uh, and here are the various views of it. It's a beta barrel with some squiggly upper stuff on the top. And there's a top-down view. And again, here is a sectional view. And you can see it's a tube with a constriction, a flange, in the middle. Uh, again, there are... Uh, uh, the, the wild type has been published. Uh, and we have heavily engineered that pore now with over 700 mutants to give us a series of pores that we can release to customers. We call it the Holy Grail because the general consensus here, after all our experience of looking at nanopores, is that this pore has a, a very considerable degree of headroom for further improvement. Uh, we really like it as our backbone pore system. And interestingly, it's got nine subunits, uh, R9, and R8 had eight subunits. Now here it is, here's the, the CSGG lipoprotein. Um, I've covered most of this. But give credit where it's due to uh, the uh, VIB, which is over in, uh, in Ghent, the lab of uh, Han Remo and, and others published that, uh, notably UCL. Uh, I know Ghent very well, very pretty Belgian town, by the way, if you want to go drink some beer and eat some fruit, 
very nice. Um, and we have a, a license to this for an exclusive license um, to develop it from our force sequencing, which is what we've done. In nature, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting in nature because its job is to translocate and do things with peptides, actually. And it's part of this biofilm formation that some bacteria can do under some conditions. So obviously a peptide translocating pore is a potential interest as well for protein sequencing. There's a little reference to the nature paper at the bottom there. That is R9. So it's the first time I've told people what the pore is, unambiguously. Now here's the R9 re release plan as part of our fast mode release. Um, so we're aiming uh, in, uh, in March to uh, release the source code for our base cores. So if you are on the developer license, you will very shortly indeed, possibly a couple of days, I think, have access to our entire base calling framework. Uh, certainly the 1D uh, HMM and the ANN source code, the uh, RNN source code. And uh, people want to do local base calling. I think people want to develop base calling. I think this gives people a head up, a leg up, I mean. It makes things transparent. Um, it might give people ideas for doing things better. Uh, it, it might help us, it might come back and help us. It's licensed under our developer license because we have this li because we don't want to help competition. We are a company, we're not academic. Quite happy to be fairly open, we just don't want to damage ourselves by helping competition. So uh, have a look at the developer license if you're interested in getting the source code for that. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, for developers, um, we're coming out with the um, R9 flow cells during March, um, and the kits will be available as well during March. And then broadly, uh, things will be available uh, shortly after to everybody else. And that developer license is, um, you know what, I think this slide is wrong. I should have looked at it. I'll just ignore this slide. I'll, I've got a better one later on. Um, Take a look at the developer license if you're a software person uh, it, and and sample prep person. It uh, it lets you do uh, it lets you get sort of first dibs on most of our stuff. Uh, we have things that we don't distribute broadly. Again, the base calling software will be downloadable from a GitHub repository on that license, and there are other goodies in there as well. Plus, you can talk to some of our internal R and D people um, and get an inside track on what's going on. Um, if you don't like the license terms, then you should talk to us. You know, we can think about changing them to make them more flexible. But again, the purpose of that license is really to make things open, but to just protect us from uh, competition. Uh, and the same. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about base calling. So for those who are interested, very, very briefly, uh, these are some overview slides we've made. So for a long time, we've had this step called event detection. And what that does is it takes raw signal and it converts it into a reduced format. And the reduced format is to uh, generate averages for sections of the data, which are the same, effectively. Now, I've never liked it. Let me just, everybody around here knows that. I just don't like it. Um, it runs using a, basically a t-test on a window uh, looking for a shift in the uh, population of raw data samples in the signal. Um, and then when you get that shift, you get a little t-test, t-statistic peak here, and then we peak find, and that's how we find the transitions. And these transitions correspond to a single base move on the enzyme. And then you have to hop through these measurements and decode them into bases effectively. Uh, now it breaks down in fast mode. Certainly when you get over 500 bases, it starts to get uh, ropey. And uh, it's in the current software and the current release, but we're looking to replace this with uh, working directly from raw data as soon as possible. It's another step that's sensitive to parameterization and all these other things. So if we can get the uh, neural networks and other methods working directly from raw samples, uh, that would be a step forward and that's a major focus of progress at the moment. But at the moment, we do this event detection step. And the HMM then, uh, uh, so then what we do is, again, in the, what we're going to release, is if you're on the developer portal, is you'll see the entire model training and application process documented as a first draft. And if there's missing detail, we'll fill it in. 
But the basic process is you align loads of squiggles to some kind of uh, to each other and you generate some kind of reference and you nudge them all together so they all fit nicely. Sort of EM alignment. Uh, you can then cross label the squiggles. You can then generate a model of KMA versus block level. And then you can have a transition model, effectively uh, overlaps in the KMAs. And uh, uh, we use a forward backward algorithm to uh, decode a posterior matrix on the 1D. Um, <clears throat> and the 2D is more complicated. Of course, the 2D, um, I'll talk about in a minute. But um, in essence, we, uh, we have to uh, roughly combine two 1Ds to get an approximate alignment and then do a, a two-dimensional uh, or three-dimensional uh, posterior decoding through a two-dimensional alignment, set of alignments. Uh, oh, yeah, here it is, exactly what I just mentioned. And in fact, it, it gets very computationally horrible. Frankly, another reason I don't like this very much. Another reason to focus on 1D is that it gets big. Uh, and we use, we use various tricks to make it smaller. We uh, truncate that matrix to try and reduce the Viterbi. Um, all of these things are probably not optimal. Although the guys have done a tremendous job with all this stuff over the years. Uh, but we're looking to simplify this, obviously. And, uh, and 1D, of course, cuts out this stuff completely, if you can work on 1D. The neural network I understand a little bit better because I've <coughs> I've sort of built my own. But essentially we can um, do the same thing of aligning squiggles to get labels to squiggles. Uh, we can learn those with what's called a bi-directional LSTM. Um, and then that can emit uh, softmax posteriors on the on threemas actually. And then we can do some sort of uh, perturbed decoding on those posteriors as a final step. Uh, in what's sort of a hybrid HMM RNN. Um, and that is giving better results on, on 1D for sure than the HMM. Um, it's got some other useful things. The, for example, the scaling is just, uh, I think what's called Z scaling. You know, it's just much, the sort of workflow around it's generally, I think, a little bit simpler. It executes about as quickly as the HMM, uh, quite variable depending on how you set up the network. Uh, and this it's quite a hot area of research, these deep neural networks. There's quite a lot being done um, on these LSTM things. Um, the thing that I'm, apart from getting rid of event detection on the front and using raw data, on the other end, I'm quite keen to use some other uh, methods of dealing with the outputs, possibly something called CTC. Uh, so this is quite an active area of research for us now. Uh, and again, the source code uh, for that, actually we use some public packages for that as well as our own source code. The source code and the workflow around that will be released as part of the upcoming set of releases. So you should be able to recreate what we've done. Um, I'm going to skip that. Now let's talk about Promethean. Uh, so I think at London Calling last year, we introduced it and we said uh, we'll try and get the first box out by year end. We haven't actually shipped a box to a customer yet at all but it is pretty uh, imminent i would say so let's talk about what's going on there uh, so those not familiar with promethean again it's a uh, bench toppy box with uh, 48 uh, flow cells uh, and in total that gives you 144,000 channels remember a channel is a nanopore plus a circuit so it's got a lot of um, nanopores on it but you can you can run one flow cell, you can run all of them, you can run some of them, you can put one sample on one, you can put one sample on two, they can run for different times, you can flush them out. It's an incredibly flexible, easy to run system. Such that, for example, if you put a very big sample on all of them, you'd have the result very quickly. Um, and the way that we've commercialized this, or are commercializing it, is such that it's capital life. There's almost no capital as such it's almost all or arguably all consumable dependent. Now, which means that if you're not using it, it's not costing you anything in terms of depreciation and so forth. Uh, so for a, uh, for a big lab, I think it's ideal for a core facility with very lumpy requirements. It's, uh, it's very good uh, as a proposition. And the throughput numbers are competitive with HiSeq or HiSeq 10 even. 
certainly once once we've fixed that little shortfall on the on the uh, throughput over time, the numbers should climb um, very quickly. Uh, you can sort of think about that a bit like for those who remember um, optimizing cluster density on on Selexa Illumina. We have to optimize this yield over time issue uh, to get the, the maximum out of the system. But even in the worst case, it is a shed load of data from a relatively low cost box. Now, Promethean only run only runs R9. It, it's not an R7 system. R7 is not or R6 even. Neither pool will be available on Promethean. Promethean is only slated to run R9, and it will only ship with R9 flow cells. At the moment, we're running R9.2. I have a feeling by the time we get it, it might be R9.3, hopefully with some improvements. Now, at the bottom here, you can see this other box, which is the compute module. Uh, and this contains, as you may have guessed, some computing. Uh, I'm going to talk about what that is in a minute, but it can do uh, real-time analysis uh, and online analysis. And it can be, you know, so it, it's basically a, a manageable cluster in a box. Uh, let's have a look at that in more detail. I think it's not the next slide. Oh, here we go. So as I said, it's a very modular system, uh, 48 uh, sensor chips and 48 flow cells. You can put four samples per chip. Of course, if you're barcoding more than that, 3,000 channels per chip, up to 144,000 simultaneous channels. Those kits I spoke about earlier, those are also set up to be forwardly compatible with Promethean. That's the, the ligation kit, all the transposome kit, the 10-minute kit. And uh, contrary to what you may have read, you can now get away with very low sample inputs for nanopore sequencing. And again, quite a lot of work is going on to reducing sample input requirements. That's going quite well. The device is designed to be amenable to parallel pipetting. So if you're doing your sample stuff in plates, it should be transferable directly onto the system with very little fuss. Now, uh, it's late, a little bit late. Um, the boxes are fine. We've had a little manufacturing issue with a part of the flow cell. I'm going to talk about that. So part of uh, making the ASIC available to the chip requires an intermediate level of uh, what you might call uh, bonding electronics. And the, the, for the first version of that, it's come back with a defect. There's a gap in what's called the metal layer, which means there's no circuit there, and there's an issue with it. So we've had to re-spin that. We've had to send it all back to the manufacturer and get it fixed. And that adds a delay. That, that's uh, largely responsible for why the first box hasn't gone out yet. Little, very simple overview slide of uh, architecture, a very Mickey Mouse, really. But we have a, a parallel array of flow cells that contain a parallel array of independent sensing channels. Uh, there are computers inside the compute module with servers on that are controlling and collecting data from those. Um, and there's a job distribution system. Uh, and what that means is that you can, um, you can load share. If you're online base calling or something from one flow cell, you can actually have multiple CPUs and many threads operating on that one flow cell or vice versa. It's an obvious thing to do. Um, we base call those, the, the 1Ds online, and then we write them out either to uh, locally attached storage, if you've got if you've got it, network attached storage, or you could fire it off to cloud if you've got it. Um, the sort of bog standard default is a locally attached storage device. Uh, and we're proposing that 2D initially, 2D calling will be offline or post run with 1D online. And we'd hope to move to online 2D in the future, but we, we're not there yet. Um, I think we need to simplify the 2D before we do that, or we get 1D to a place where it's so good, most people don't really care about 2D. And if they do care about it, they're quite happy to do it post run. Uh, of course, you can 2D call on your own computers in real time. Nothing to stop you doing that. It's very flexible the way we set it up, effectively. Here is the compute module. Um, it contains, really, it's a cluster in a box. Uh, the initial version has 12 uh, quad core i7 slave nodes. We're working on a version with 24 as well. Uh, there's uh, uh, 12 times two, there's a lot of storage in there uh, for buffering of data. It's a Slurm job scheduler, for those of you who know what it is. It's all web, it's got a master node that lets you run everything via the web. 
and it's got two 10 gigabit fiber uplinks out the back. Uh, there's also some gigabit on there, and it's running at Ubuntu 14. Uh, it mounts SIFS and NFS. We may do others. But that's the baseline specification for the compute module. And to some people, it's important to know that. Now, here are some Prometheans in build. Um, the one on the far left is by far the most advanced, effectively, because the box is effectively the first shipping system. Um, here's our network attached storage. No, it doesn't need to be that big. That's just ours. Um, and it, the one on the far right here is the least uh, least advanced. Um, we're initially building about four to six per month, but we're going to get to 10 per month later in the year. And uh, if you do the maths on that, we can probably clear the backlog, the existing backlog by year end. Uh, so uh, that's good news for Prometheus orders. We intend to uh, have them all out by year end. I think even if we have new orders, we'll probably be able to get most of those out by year end. Uh, so the target delivery there is to have everybody with an order in with a box, at least one box by year end, and there's probably there's capacity for more orders as well, I think. Now, if you are in the queue and what I have said does not please you, then now would be the time to talk to us. We, uh, we can refund deposits if you like, but that will mean you will lose your place in the queue and somebody else will take it. But uh, now would be a good time, now that you've got visibility of all the details, to uh, talk to us about it. Promethean starts with R9. The only port it will run when it ships is R9. Uh, after that, there's an R10 in the background, and I'm sure there'll be other things that we can put on there in future. But it starts with R9. That's the CSS, uh, CSGG port I mentioned earlier. Uh, this, is a, this is the slide I wanted. Much simpler. So uh, this is March here, yeah? this little timeline. So source code for base callers will be available to developers imminently. Um, the sequencing kits uh, that I mentioned earlier are within probably a week or two. R9 flow cells, we would aim to uh, start shipping those within a couple of weeks. And the rapid sequencing kit, again, thereabouts, a couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> now there's a, a, a Minnow version coming, uh, which is R9. Uh, compatible and that's also uh, probably going to come in a couple of weeks time and then we're aiming to get the first Promethean uh, out at the end of March the first customer with R9 uh, I hope that's reasonably clear so it's all happening in March is the basic essence there's a, a batch of releases during March uh, give or take now obviously if we hit some kind of glitches in March some things may slip but there's a blob of stuff coming your way in March. Is the key, key, key message here. So let me summarize what's happening. So, so we're transitioning everybody to R9 point something during March. And when that's done, we will obsolete R7. It's goodbye to R7. The same way that we obsoleted R6. Now R9 in our hands, at the moment, it's giving us a mean 85 1D and a mean 95 2D, and it's improving very rapidly. Uh, so it's the uh, it's the way forward as far as we're concerned, in particular because it enables that 1D utility for most people, not everybody, but for most of our customers, we know that's important. Promethean shipping end of March, first customer, um, only with R9. It's an R9 system. Now we're doing base caller source code releases under developer license, uh, imminently. Uh, and you, you, off you go, basically. Uh, but also, um, uh, I think it's April, I've got it slated down. Uh, there will be an integrated base caller, integrated local base caller in Minnow, hopefully in April. So if you're not on the developer license and, and somebody else doesn't write some software for you, you will have a local base caller in Minnow, roughly speaking, in April, certainly before London calling happens. So there's two local base callers. There's a source code one on the developer, and there's a non-source code one that will be integrated with Minnow. The source code one's coming first. 
Now, fast mode, as I said, the big one is fast mode is in March uh, on R9 at 250 to 300 basis per second. And what will then happen is, over time, we will increase the speed to 500 basis per second. But initially, we're going out with, say, 280. That still gives you a lot of data. And our target is, our build plan, is to clear the Promethean order backlog by year end. Okay, so that, that hopefully covers the, uh, the news in this talk in outline. Uh, now, there will be a full update uh, and a bunch of new features spoken about at our London Calling Conference in May. So I'm not talking about everything today, I'm just talking about the things which are pertinent. At the moment, there's a bunch of other stuff coming your way in May. Also, I would hope that our experts, the people who've written the base callers and the people who've done the sample preps, can give some quite detailed seminars um, at London Calling later in the year. Also hoping that by releasing R9 and the base callers, uh, some of our uh, sort of developer type customers will have developed their own stuff to talk about that, that's new and exciting in time for London Calling. And just to remind everybody that the big, our big conference is London Calling, 26th, 27th of May. Uh, it's open to all. Uh, and that's when we do most of our uh, major updates rather than minor updates like we've done today. I'm just going to go back to that summary slide, just to really hammer it home. It wasn't clear from the other slides. We're transitioning to R9 during March. And when that's done, we will say goodbye to R7. Uh, at the moment, we're getting 85% 1D and 95% 2D. That will improve. Promethean will ship end of March, we think, only with R9. We're doing a base caller source code release under a developer license, and then later, probably April, an integrated local base caller in Minnow for everybody else. Fast mode is now being released in March as part of that. It's at 280 basis per second, but we intend to move it to 500 in the future, probably over the summer. Engineers are confident that the build plan they have, we will clear the Promethean order backlog by year end. And finally, just remind everybody about the London Calling Conference in May. And with that, I will attempt to stop and see if I can uh, get my face on the screen. That's possible. So I think we're going to stop there, and I'm going to take some questions uh, from our customers via our portal. Uh, and I will have to... Uh, I'll have to talk about that on the screen, I think. So let's have a look at the question, shall we? Are there any questions? That's the question. Let's have a scan. Yeah, so the first one's from Paul Gordon, who says, I'm extremely keen on the transposon mediated sample prep, as my target applications only require 1D. Uh, but I do want a quick turnaround and sample prep. What's the state of this technology and when will customers get it? Well, I've just answered that, hopefully. Hopefully, quite clear. The state of it is it's really good and within a week to whatever, March, that should be in your hands in fast mode format. Uh, let's look at another question. Uh, uh, somebody asking fast mode, asking for it at London Calling. Well, it's coming out in March. At least this mezzanine fast mode, this 300, 250 basis per second fast mode, will be uh, available to everybody imminently. Uh, somebody's asking, uh, I haven't heard anything about when to expect $20 flow cells. That was one of the features that we uh, spoke about last year. What, we, uh, what do we call it? Um, a name for it, a pricing model, a sort of elastic pricing model. That is still very much on the cards. It's coming. Um, that is something we will certainly update people about at London Calling. I think what we're waiting for, I think we'd want to have R9 out for that, and we'd want to have those yield numbers up uh, uh, with the, um, the yield loss fix. So I think So when everybody's getting high yield, I think that triggers a change of pricing, like we discussed. 
Uh, we're not quite in that position at the moment, but it's definitely still on the cards. We haven't forgotten about it. Somebody says, what about nanopore technology for protein analysis and microRNA? Well, again, I'm hoping that at London Calling, we can show some very positive results on direct RNA sequencing, certainly. And obviously, this CSGG pore might have some potential for looking at proteins. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what we have by May. Somebody else asks about RNA. Direct RNA, I know it's very popular. <laughs> it's being worked on. Uh, quite promising. The, the complication is you need to find a motor that works really nicely with RNA. The, the DNA motors do work, but they don't work that well. Uh, I think we have a candidate now that's quite a good motor. I also think that these, uh, these neural network based 1D decoding methods are probably better for RNA decoding. Again, that's work in progress. Um, da -da -dum. Somebody asking for details about Promethean. Yeah, well, I've just mentioned that. Uh, somebody's asking what the first test sites will be. Well, we don't name, we not, uh, we generally assume customers want it to be confidential uh, unless, they, unless they, um, that they choose not to be. We wouldn't name customers without their permission. Suffice to say, it's global. You know, it's global. Uh, and the order numbers are really good. Uh, you know, it looks very healthy. Somebody says they'd be interested in a combined DNA and mRNA analysis protocol or a combined sample prep. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, perhaps there's a 1D version that does both. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. It would be interesting to uh, ask about running samples without an internet connection. Right, well, what you need there is what I just announced, which is a local base caller. Um, and the second thing is you'll need some you need to be able to do something with the output. Um, we have we have uh, we've thought about that. Uh, we, we don't have a local metric or yet, a local epitome yet. Um, but I, you, you'll certainly have local base calling very shortly. Um, somebody else asks about direct RNA. It's coming. It's coming. Somebody asks, can you effectively get rid of short 2KB reads with the transposase. Well, I showed the distribution on that, and you can see the majority of them, the N50 apparently, are much longer than 2KB. Now, again, I know other platforms out there use long read enrichment steps to pull out the longer version, the longer subpopulation. Obviously, the expense of input material. There's nothing to stop me doing that here. Um, I wonder if the transposase can be tuned. Uh, or something. Well, well, yeah, it's work in progress. Somebody says, will these slides be available? Well, I think the Hangout is filmed and the film will be online. So they're, in that sense, they're available. Somebody says, any possibility to release the RNN base caller to combine with the current R7 chemistry? Well, the code for the RNN will be available shortly. You can do what you like with it. Um, to do that, you will have to train an R7 network. Um, and we have documented the training process as we use it. Uh, but bear in mind, we intend to obsolete R7 as soon as R9 is fully enabled in field. Now, Verlich, why does DNA mix block the pore? Don't know. It's a real puzzle. Uh, it's really weird. We don't know. Uh, but it's definitely, well, reasonably confident that's the fundamental causative mechanism. Exactly what's happening, we don't know. There's some evidence that um, it's something to do with supercoiling uh, as the DNA is stripped, as the enzyme processes along the DNA. Uh, but it's definitely our main area of focus right now is to get rid of that so that we're just processing strand after strand after strand at a fairly constant rate over time. That's the next big breakthrough, I think. Are you working on a Minnow version for Unix systems? Uh, yeah, I'm, I think it's I think it's available under developer licensing. I think there's a version I, I, either it's out there or it's shortly to be out there, where Minnow runs as, as effectively as kind of web service. 
uh, in a platform, cross-platform way. And then the GUI is just a bunch of web pages. This is how it works. Um, uh, because that's effectively what's embedded uh, you know, on the computer that you're running. Uh, now, uh, and that code, I, I know people have run it on, on OS, on Mac for certain. My guess would be it's Unix compatible as well. So the answer is it's coming. And it, it may even be out for developers, I'm not sure. But certainly there will be a Mac Unix minnow uh, within some weeks from now, if, if not already. Let me refresh the uh, page, see if anything else pops in. Uh, 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 just move back up again. Uh, uh, uh. Will the local base caller in Minnow need a lot of RAM? I'm buying computers now. For 1D, no. I think it's mostly CPU bound. Obviously, put as much memory in as you can. For 2D, I think it, I think it is just on memory, the 2D. Again, this 1D is much more efficient in principle. Uh, so um, it should be fine with either the HMM or the RNN. Somebody's asked, will I be able to make small insert libraries with the transpose protocol? I don't know is the answer. Um, one of our uh, applications or sample prep people can answer that one offline. Given the major increase in data throughput with the R9 flow cells, will there be efforts to further limit the size of the FAST5 files? Uh, do, 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 do. So the amount of data coming off is big. I will look into that. Um, I, I think that I need to understand which version of Minnow we're talking about. Uh, I think that when the fast mode Minnow that we use on fast mode on our laptops or our little computers seems to be fine. Uh, and we use a slightly different file format. So I just need to make sure that question isn't effectively uh, out of date. Are there any groups working with the Min9 in Hawaii? I don't know. I don't know. Probably is my answer. Hawaii is asking about. Just want to be clear, how many base pairs are in a pour at any given time? Well, that's a, that's a complicated question, frankly, because the pour starts up here. And there's an arrow bit and uh, it's very variable depending on the pour and there's more to it than there's more to what's going on in there the number of base pairs there's water shells there's things sticking to things everything's jiggling around it, you know it's quite complicated what i will say is on r9 we think that most of the signal is coming from two bases uh, and then, and then we, we capture most of it with modeling with three bases. Uh, so on R9, it's, but then you have this other problem, not problem, but you get some peripheral effects. Obviously there's some edge effects going on, uh, some, some sort of broader contexts. Um, and it looks like the uh, RNNs are catch, catching that much better than the HMN, which seems to be somewhat short-sighted. Will Minnow CPU core count and memory requirements be increased? Not much. Uh, probably not. Probably not. One of these fairly manageable, we think. Um, what do you think are the biggest hurdles to using Minion for sequencing in remote field sites? Well, I think first of all, you, local base core, you want that. Although I still maintain that most parts of the world have the bandwidth to do remote analysis certainly I still think you can do the bioinformatics remotely uh, of course the biggie is the Voltrax device I haven't spoken about today and that is uh, an enclosed encapsulated sample prep where certainly for things in liquid we can do extraction transposase cleaning and automatically introduce into the flow cell so really that from liquid to DNA getting to the pore we're trying to encapsulate that in the Voltrax and that should make it completely field enabled. Nor you shouldn't need um, pipette tips and boxes and all the other stuff. Uh, we, we just want you to go from, almost literally from, simply from liquid sample to base calls on one little device. That's what we're heading towards. How fast is local base? It's pretty quick. It's quick enough. Uh, I think we've, uh, roughly speaking, between 10 
kb and 80 kb per second on a laptop i think so, so i think it's quick enough to keep up uh voltrax i can provide an upgrade on voltrax but we're saving that for london calling that, that's a major thing for london calling um we're in the queue for an r9 uh, for a mark one would you recommend we wait for the r9 um the, the slides are too complicated I, I skipped over them um you can contact our customer support department but um we will transition you in a way that doesn't do you any harm whether you're waiting or you've got some, we will make sure that you get what you need in terms of R9 in a timely way. We, we won't leave anybody out or leave anybody caught short. Uh, so my advice would be just get on with it. Talk to customer support. And there's a transition plan for moving people at different stages onto R9 as quickly as possible. Any news concerning run -into? Well, the man to ask there is Matt Luce, actually, because he's done most of the work on that um importantly what we did was in minnow there's an api that he uses to taste the reads as they're going through the core and that api i think i will check i would hope it's enabled for everybody um, he's had a version of minnow with that api in it and my bet would be that version is is either out already or it's going out within a couple of weeks so you should be able to implement run until at least the public domain version once you've got that api uh, david eccles what's the biggest chemical killer of the flow cell membrane uh, the membranes should be really really very robust and we routinely test them with things like um, uh, blood and plasma uh, diluted usually three times older versions would be tougher we test them on plant extracts um, because it's a um, you know a, a, a you know a hydrophobic uh, membrane system surfactants if you put in if you're going to put in detergents and surfactants they, they're going to mess with the membrane um, but what the ones we have we test routinely with um, quite nasty things that you find in biology if not under the sink uh, and uh, we have membrane upgrades coming didn't speak about them today. There's some interesting action on the membrane side as well, which I'll save for London calling, if it's finished by then. Let's see, any more questions? Any G quadruplex issues? I don't think that's the problem. I could be wrong. Uh, I mean, if you think G quadruplexes are, uh, because you know what, we spent some time looking at G quadruplexes on pores uh, for another application we were playing with in the old days. Uh, I, I, I think most pores strip tree quadruplexes, certainly on top of the enzyme. Uh, what we found in that old system was that if you capture a tree quadruplex in the atrium of the pore, it will hold stable for some time period and then strip. So I don't think that's the issue. Um, will guidance on the Mark II device be available? Uh, so that there is no, uh, there's no Mark II uh, Minion uh, planned. Um, we, it's Mark I fast mode is what we are with for the foreseeable future. Uh, the other device we have is Promethean. Okay, there's no Mark II Minion on the horizon as things stand. It's Mark I fast mode and Promethean. So with that, I'm going to stop uh, because my uh, <clears throat> my voice is going. I hope that was uh, informative and useful. Um, any further questions, you can continue to post on the portal. And uh, any any uh, issues, you can contact our customer support group today or tomorrow. And I hope that's uh, exciting. So what I'm going to do is very quickly just go back to that summary slide. If I can do that very quickly. Just so I've got that across there. Um, bear with me a second. Let me just go back to the summary slide. Do, 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 do. There we go. So we're transitioning to R9 point something during March. 
And when that has been done successfully in a way that doesn't leave anybody behind or leave anybody caught out, we're going to say goodbye to our seven. It becomes obsolete. We're getting 85% 1D, 95% 2D, and that's improving quite rapidly on that R9 fast mode system. There's a fast mode. Promethean, targeting end of March, only ships with R9. Base caller source code is coming for people who are under our developer license. That lets you do local base calling. But a non-developer licensed, available to everybody local base caller, will follow on from that, and that will be integrated in Minnow. And I think that's April. Uh, so fast mode is effectively being released in March at 280 basis per second on R9. Our plan will be to move that to 500 basis over time, over this year. Uh, we're pretty confident we will clear that Promethean order backlog by year end. Um, uh, and uh, many more things to talk about in much more detail at London Calling in May. So with that, I'm going to stop and say uh, have a good day to all of you. Goodbye.